Do you remember uh, the time where you accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior? Now, you may not remember the exact hour or the day or even the year, but think about what you was experiencing, what you was feeling through that particular time when you accepted Christ. I think it's good to kind of go back every once in a while and think about the joy that was in our heart when we accepted, accepted Christ. Well, let me ask you a question. What did, it, what did it cost us to become a Christian? I think the clearest verses that I have ever found in Scripture concerning what it cost on our part to become a Christian is found in Romans and uh, Romans 10:9, where it says, "With the mouth we confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, and with the heart we believe that God raised Jesus from the dead, and we will be saved." So salvation is a matter of our heart and our mouth, what we say because what we believe in our heart. We believe that Jesus was the Son of God. We believe that Jesus died for our sins personally. And we believe that Jesus Christ is the only one that can truly make us right with God. And we admit that we do have sin that separates us from God. So when we have those beliefs in our heart and we're willing to say those beliefs, that's, uh, that's what it's going to cost us to accept Jesus Christ as our Savior. Uh, now, so what did it cost us to become Christians? Well, it didn't cost us a whole lot. It, it cost us our, our faith in Christ. But think about what we received because we was willing to set our side our pride to admit that we're a sinner and to believe in Christ, what is the gift that God gave us because of our belief? Well, in Romans 6, 23, it says, for this, the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. The greatest gift that any man or any woman could ever possibly receive is eternal life. And think about that. It didn't cost us much to allow God to provide us that free gift of eternal life. We didn't have to pay much, but Jesus did. Jesus is the one that paid the cost of our salvation through his blood and through his life. Now, I got a different question for you. <clears throat> How much does it cost for us to be the disciples of Jesus? Now, that's a whole different question. And there is a price involved in becoming Jesus' disciple, and it's very high. Now, so there's lots of people that think that once you're a Christian, you're a disciple of Jesus Christ. But I beg to differ about that. I think there is a difference, and I believe Scripture lines up with that. Um, let's, first of all, let's talk about, well, what does it mean to be a disciple of Jesus? What does that word disciple mean? Disciple means a learner, a student, someone who is learning from someone else, learning their ways. And so the disciples were learning about Jesus, learning his ways. They want to be like Jesus Christ. And so anybody that decides to become a disciple, to study Jesus' ways, to become like Jesus, they set a very high bar for themselves. Uh, this is a very lofty goal. And as most of you know, we're never going to reach that bar of perfection as uh, to be like Jesus Christ. But to even be on that track, to become like Christ, to be a disciple of, of Jesus, 
that is a a momental a momental effort uh, and to strive to be like Jesus Christ, uh, you're, it won't take you very long if you if you decide to get on that track and on that path to realize that you're not going to be able to do that in yourself, that you're going to have to have the Lord's help to do that. Now, let's think about uh, when Jesus was here on earth ministering. <clears throat> Now, during that time that Jesus was ministering, there was a lot, there was thousands of people that believed in Jesus, believed that Jesus was the Son of God, that he was the Messiah. But all of all those thousands of people, there was only 12 disciples. Now, let me back up. I know the scripture says there were like 70 disciples in one verse in the Bible, but it's obvious when you study scripture, um, they might have followed Jesus, but those 12, well, actually 11, because we can't count uh, Judas Iscariot in there, those 11 were totally committed uh, to, uh, to Christ and paid a huge price for being Jesus' disciple, for learning his ways, uh, for being their, his helper and being there for him. They paid a huge price for that. Uh, they had to, to forsake their families. They had to quit their jobs. So, um, you know, they paid, a, they paid a large price. There's an, another scripture now I want us to turn to in, in uh, uh, Matthew. And that's in Matthew chapter 8, verses 19 to 22. Matthew 8 Verses 19 to 22. Then a scribe came and said to him, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus said to him, The foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Another of the disciples said to him, Lord, permit me first to go and bury my father. But Jesus said to him, Follow me, and allow the dead to bury their own dead. So we see two men that want to be the disciples of Jesus Christ, that want to follow him. The first one it talks about is a scribe, a religious man that believes in Jesus and who he is and wants to become his disciples. And so what does Jesus tell this man? He tells him that, hey, I don't even have a home. I don't even have a, a pillow to lay my head on. You sure you want to be my disciple? That's basically what Jesus is telling him. And then the second man that wants to follow Jesus he wants to go home and bury his father before he follows Jesus. And Jesus says, let the dead bury the dead. You need to follow me. That seems harsh. So what is Jesus really saying here? It sounds like he almost is discouraging these men to become his disciples. But what Jesus is doing here is he's wanting them to count the cost of being his disciple. Are they really committed? to uh, follow him. And he knew these men's hearts and where they was at. So I'm not saying for us to be Jesus' disciples. Well, we have to leave our families and uh, quit our jobs. But what I am saying is that there is a high cost in being Jesus' disciple. And I want to look at that cost in Scripture to know exactly what it costs us to be a disciple of Christ. And I'm going to look at four different scriptures. The first one we're going to look at is in Matthew. Matthew 20, verses 20 to 28. Matthew 20, verses 20 to 28. Then the mother of the sons of Zebedee came to Jesus with her sons, bowing down and making a request of him. And he said to her, What do you wish? She said to him, 
Command that in their, your kingdoms the two, these two sons of mine may sit one on the right and one on the left. But Jesus answered, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I'm about to drink? They said to him, We are able. He said to them, My cup you shall drink, but to sit on my right and on my left, this is not mine to give, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared by my Father. And hearing this, the ten became indignant with the two brothers. But Jesus called them to himself and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them, and their great men exercise authority over them. It is not this way among you, but whoever wishes to become great among you shall be your servant, and whoever wishes to be first among you shall be your slave, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. What is one of the prices that has to be paid to become Jesus' disciple? You have to have a servant's heart. <clears throat> You have to have a, a greater concern for other people's needs than your selfish desires and wants. Um, and so uh, that it can be a huge price to pay. And, it, and it's not natural to be concerned more about others than yourself. Again, that has to be a work of the Spirit. But that's the work that has to be done in our hearts. In a, us for us to be truly a disciple of Jesus Christ. Well, let's look at another price that has to be paid. Uh, we're going to look at Matthew this time, Matthew 19.30. Matthew 19.30. But many who are first will be last, and the last first. To be a disciple of Jesus Christ, you have to suppress the pride that comes from your flesh. That pride that wants to make you number one, that wants you to be in the limelight. That cannot be operated, that type of pride cannot be operating in your life if you truly are going to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. And there's lots of times that we'll have to take a back seat to others in order for God to be glorified, not for us to be glorified. And uh, I'll have to admit, this is one area in my life that has prevented me from paying that cost and becoming a disciple like I should to Jesus Christ. And it's taking the work of the Holy Spirit to overcome that so that I'm starting to be willing to pay that price. But that's a huge price. Uh, suppress that pride that wants to make you first, that wants to glorify you, to be able to glorify God. And uh, that's the only way that you're truly going to be able to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. Well, let's look at another cost that Jesus talks about in Luke. This time, it is in Luke chapter 9 verses verses 23 to 25 Luke 9 verses 23 to 25 <clears throat> and he was saying to them all if anyone wishes to come after me he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me for whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake, he is the one who will save it. For well, what is a man profit if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? That makes it very plain. Jesus makes it very plain that the high price that has to be paid to be his disciples. Um, you have to deny self. You, never, you can no longer allow your flesh to influence your life and to um, 
draw you to the world and its ways uh, and its priorities. Uh, but you have to deny that. You gotta let the the, the, uh, the pick up that cross, and what I think that means is to crucify the flesh, to crucify self, and we need to do that daily. And the best way to do that daily is to spend time with the Lord. Make time to be in prayer, to be in Bible study, so that you truly are a student and a learner of Jesus Christ, learning His ways um, and allowing the Holy Spirit to take those truths and to change your heart. That's, a, that's truly a disciple of, of Jesus Christ. Uh, okay, there's one more scripture I want to look at concerning the cost that we have to pay to be a, a disciple of Christ. And this time, it's in one of my favorite scriptures, is Romans 12. Romans 12, verses 1 to 2. Romans 12, verses 1 to 2. Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove that the will of God is that which is good and acceptable and perfect. So those verses right there really uh, hone in on exactly what it, the cost will be to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. It's going to have to be a sacrifice of our life, which is a total commitment, willing to give up all for Christ. And that's the, that's the price that's going to have to be paid to be a, 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 a follower, a disciple of Jesus Christ. And, and in verse 1, it says, this is your reasonable service, spiritual service. This is the way you should worship. It's by turning your life over to Christ. Because that's the only way you truly are going to recognize God as being holy and all-powerful. And you're saying to God, I'm not God. You're God. I need you. Uh, and I need you to guide me through this life. And so, therefore, I'm willing to make that sacrifice of my life uh, so that, uh, that you can be what you're wanting to be inside my life. Now, that's a very high price, just to turn your life completely over to Christ. And this is a reason why there are so many Christians that are not willing to pay that price. And because they're not willing to pay that price... That's why they're conformed to the world. They look like the world. They sound like the world. They act like the world. <clears throat> and they're fine with Jesus dying for their sins so they can have eternal life. But as far as messing with their life and the way they live, mm -mm. Don't, don't do that. You know, That's a way a lot of Christians uh, are thinking. I want you to think about what God did in the Old Testament when he freed Israelites from Egyptian slavery. In order for the Israelites to get into the Promised Land, they had to cross two bodies of water. And I think that's true about us as Christians. There are two bodies of water spiritually we have to cross before we actually get into the promised land and, and receive all the things that God wants, to ha wants us to have as his children. <clears throat> well, the first body of water that the Israelites had to cross was the Red Sea. Now, once they crossed the Red Sea, where did they enter? Well, they came into the desert. And how did they respond? Because they were in the desert. Well, they'd just been freed from the bondage of slavery. But now they're in a position where there are circumstances where there is no water, there is no food. 
and of course they start complaining because all their focus is, is on themselves and on their world and on them circumstances. Well, to me, this is just like when a Christian accepts salvation, that he crosses the Red Sea, but once he accepts Christ as Savior, he comes into the desert. And he, all again, he uh, focuses on the world, uh, in uh, the things of the world, uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the discomfort, and all the things that they have to face. You know, they, they're not coming into a bowl of jelly and life is going to be good from then on after salvation. In fact, a lot of times when um, a Christian first becomes a Christian, they're actually more miserable as a Christian than they was before they became a Christian because now there's a conviction of sin in their life and the way they had lived. So that's that desert experience that almost all Christians experience uh, before they get in cross the Jordan River and go in the Promised Land. And that's the second body of, of water <clears throat> The Israelites had to cross to get in the promised land. Now remember, that first generation, they had to die off because they, they didn't have the faith to cross the Jordan River. It took that new generation <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> to, have, <coughs> to have the faith they needed to be able to cross that Jordan River. <coughs> And once they got into the Jordan River, that's when they started to experience the promised land and all the things that God had wanted for the Israelites. Well, to me, crossing the Jordan River for a Christian is the same as when they come to the point where they're willing to make a sacrifice of themselves and allow Jesus to become the Lord of their life and uh, to deny self um, and to become, to pay that price of becoming a disciple. That's when they cross the Jordan River, and that's when they get into the promised land and start receiving the things that God wants us to have as a child of God. <clears throat> now, once the Israelites got into the promised land, now, there was, there was battles to fight. You know, they had to overcome the people that were living, the Canaanites that were living in that land at that particular time so that they could start enjoying the promises and the blessings of God. And it's the same way. There's battles to fight. You know, we don't, we're not resting back on our laurels and once we cross the yard and say, wow, we have arrived in the promised land. There's going to be battles for us to fight, plenty of battles to fight. There's going to be a lot of temptation that's going to come your way. And Satan is going to fight harder against you now that you've made that commitment to be a disciple of Christ. And so <clears throat> the main battle that we're going to be fighting is the battle for our mind. And there's going to be days where we lose that battle and there's going to be days that we win that battle but the more we're committed and to follow Christ and to become his disciple and the more willing we are to pay the price of denying self and surrendering to him the more we're going to be victorious in Christ and the more blessings and the more promises that we're going to receive as God's child <clears throat> so there is a very high price to pay to be the disciple of Jesus Christ. But the rewards we receive because of that commitment is well worth it. Let me ask you one more question. Do you want an effective prayer life that it talks about in James 5.16? that the righteous person that has an effective prayer life accomplishes much. To have that type of prayer life where God intervenes in your life, your family, your church, your community, your country, 
you have to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. You To be righteous, to have that effective prayer life, you have to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. You have to be committed to Him. You have to yield to God. You have to surrender to His will. Uh, you have to give up the self that wants to be influenced by its flesh. <clears throat> that price has to be paid in order for you to have an effective prayer life that releases God's power and makes us change in the world. And I tell you today, there's no greater need than there is right now for there to be more of Jesus' disciples. <clears throat> so with that, let me go ahead and close our Bible study out uh, with prayer. Father, I come to you now as one of your children that has received your grace and your forgiveness and your love and your goodness. <clears throat> and uh, it's because of that grace and that love that I'm willing to, to, to make and to pay that price of becoming a disciple of Jesus Christ. But I know there's many times in my life where the flesh really works against me, that pride that I've talked about that comes against me, that keeps me from being exactly the follower that you're wanting me to be as your child. <clears throat> And I thank you, Father, that you never give up on me or you never give up on my brothers and sisters. And you're totally committed to us. And I continue to ask, Father, that there's a work of the Spirit in our hearts to become more and more like Christ, to be the disciples that we need to be to show the love of Christ to this, this, this fallen world, this lost world that we live in at this particular time. And I just pray that, again, that work of the Spirit continues for, for Temple and also for Redeemer so that we can be the church that you want us to be. And I pray this all in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. So God bless. Enjoy the rest of the day. And uh, we'll see you next Saturday on Sunday School on Facebook. Bye now.